Well, hello, Canada. Happy Monday. Welcome back to the One Soccer Hangout. Joining myself and Oliver Platt today is Toronto star writer, one soccer analyst extraordinaire, and homeowner, Laura Armstrong. Laura, welcome to the show. How are things aside from, you know, a small purchase you've recently made? Things are great. It's, yeah, it's been a month in the new home and it's, uh, it's, it's working out pretty well. So thankfully the big job is done and now I can just exist in quarantine like everybody else, like a sloth. The, the bar cart's not in shot anymore, though, so that's know, a little upsetting. the bar upsetting. cart is gone. The bar cart is, is no longer. It's, there's a bar covered now, so, yeah. Ooh, we've yeah. upgraded, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, exactly. if you're trying to sell that bar cart, I know a guy who wants one. <laughs> Ollie, how are things, buddy? Back at home, didn't want to go into the office today. I really don't blame you. No, at home today. Um, <laughs> not much news to update, so how, how's things in phase two, Adam? Because I'm noticing something different about you this week. What, what, do you, what could you be talking about? <laughs> I have no idea what this could be. Thank you. Don't acknowledge it on Friday. So I'm glad uh, no, I, I that we're getting the praise to, sorry. now. No, things in small town Ontario phase two are going really well. Restaurants are opening up. Got a dentist appointment tomorrow. It's like this whole coronavirus thing never happened. Do you want me to keep going? Because I can keep bragging about it. But I think I'm going to lose some viewers out of fear, pure frustration. Well, yeah. I, I bubbled this weekend. It was very exciting. Like seeing another person was great. Was so you chose exciting. your 10 or have you, are you doing yeah, tryouts no, for no. your 10? Yeah, I just, I like <laughs> eased into it with like a couple of friends and uh, then we'll, we'll see. We'll see who else like makes the rankings. <laughs> Keep us up. Next time we have you on, we'll, yeah. we'll get an update on the Laura <laughs> exactly. Armstrong social I'll bubble. You know how it goes. <laughs> well, in the meantime, since we're not quite there with your 10 yet, we should get to our big talking point of the day. And that is discussing that Kenneth Heiner Muller will be leaving the national team at the end of August that was announced last Wednesday. So just Laura, initial thoughts from someone who's covered the team for quite a while, developed a bit of a relationship with Kenneth. What did you, were you surprised by the news or what was your reaction to it? Yeah, I was surprised by the news. I wasn't surprised by where he's going. I think that, you know, that opportunity comes up and, and it's, it's a great opportunity to go uh, work for the Danish uh, Football Association and it, that's his home and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I I understand that the gentleman who he's replacing who had been in there for a long time. So maybe this was a conversation that had been having they'd been having internally for a while. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe this was, you know, his sort of planned after and ended and 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 he had sort of sights set on the I was certainly surprised I mean he hasn't been in the job that long um it feels like they're sort of there's been a lot of upheaval on the coaching side with these women and I know that you know the transition from John to Kenneth Heiner Moeller was not hard because he had been there already Kenneth um and I know that most of the coaching staff are the same so I think that's good for the team but I mean, to leave a year before the Olympics, to not even finish the cycle, like, I think that's a new, and uh, I think that it, it sort of, I know everything got messed up because of coronavirus, and maybe we're seeing one of the, one of the sort of implications of that in regards to this team. Ollie? Yeah, I, I was surprised when it happened as well, because obviously, you know, it kind of came out of nowhere, but I you know, when you think about it, you do wonder whether he would have stayed beyond the Olympics. Um, Obviously, you know, Canada soccer looks at things, I think, in these kind of four-year cycles of of a World Cup and an Olympics. And, you know, if there was a great feeling of enthusiasm around the team and about the idea of of continuing the way they are for another four years, right? So I I think it it was probably always likely that the Olympics would have been his last tournament. And, And so in that sense, you know, maybe not as surprising, but it certainly came out of the blue. Mm -hmm. so that's a bit of the why now and it's a good point Laura he wasn't here very long taking over the program in January of 2018 Mm -hmm. if my math is 20 wins five draws and 10 losses or something along those lines but I think when you look at the macro the big picture of it it might seem like a bit of a disappointment or an underwhelming period because if if it was going to always be this short and it was a transition phase did we really get anywhere new because obviously We've had some results. The World Cup wasn't as good as it expected. There was a chance for a big result again. Fine tournament that fizzled out as well. So, Laura, when you look back on this, or when the general public looks back on this, what do you think will be the takeaway? Is is what sort of impact he left? I kind of feel like this is going to be like a moment in Canada soccer history that we forget happened. Like I don't know that it was all that. I mean, you saw some vets leave, I guess, under him, but the results were kind of meh. 
Um, the, the, the big games that they want to win, what this team has set themselves out and publicly said is that they need to start beating the best teams in the world. And under Kenneth Ender Muller, they didn't necessarily start beating the best teams in the world. Like they had some results against them. They, nothing more than they had under Herdman. I mean, Herdman was larger than life, right? So I think for a, a coach to come in and be a lot more reserved was always going to be, um, a, it was going to be a different time. And I, I just don't really think that he made his mark. So I think you're going from like the Marache era, which was so terrible. And then you go to the highs of the John Herdman era. And now I can think like, that's the Kenneth Heiner Muller era. Are we going to be like, who's the coach of the Canadian soccer team that those couple of years? And I think that that might be the case. I don't think that that's how the players feel. Um, I think that that's a public, per, like sort of more from an outsider's perception, public perception kind of happened that marked the last couple of years in terms of success but really liked Kenneth Heiner Muller and I think that he left, left an impact with them so or which is I mean I think that's important but yeah I think that this is going to be kind of like a weird blip on the radar somehow because it was like mid-cycle and that's partly because of the way that he got the job like John Herdman just like woke up one day and was like I'm gonna coach the men's team now that's how it seemed anyways so it was just like a very weird time and I, I don't think you'd want this much coaching turnover if you could draw it up yeah no, I, like, sir, like, wouldn't be the plan no sorry just to add like like Laura's in reality things did happen and, and there was work done and, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that but from the outside looking in you kind of look back at the past two years and nothing's really happened. Um, Christine Sinclair broke the record, but that was obviously an individual accomplishment. Um, you know, the build-up to the World Cup results were okay, but the team wasn't playing particularly exciting football or, or particularly strong opponents. The World Cup was disappointing. All fell apart after that. Olympic qualifying, you know, that the minimum expectation is obviously just to qualify and, and they tick that box. But other than that, you know, there weren't a ton of uh, particularly memorable results or really any memorable results at all. And yeah, I, I don't think it's a period that we'll, we'll look back on um, as, as a really defining time in the history of, of the women's national team. But I, I think maybe some things, as I said, that we can talk about later were maybe achieved under the surface a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we're going to turn the discussion to the future in just a minute. But I want to ask you about Christine Sinclair. Ali, you brought it up and Laurie, the illusion here, what you pointed to was that Inside the room, the feelings might be a little bit different, maybe a little more positive. The day that Canada Soccer announced that he was going to be stepping down, Sinclair did thing for Kenneth, his ability to push and get the most out of everyone while truly caring about each individual is something I've rarely experienced. Kenneth, thank you. Does that seem a little bit more just the perhaps the emotional or personal connection the two of them had and not results driven? Because it doesn't seem like, aside from her record, which he will always be on that game sheet for, that the two of them didn't seem to accomplish a ton together. Or? I think that he was a real players coach. That's the that's my understanding of his reputation. And I, I don't necessarily know that the, the system has had a players coach for a while. Um, so I think that, that the players really took to that. I think it, it, it was a really hard position for him to come into after Herdman. Herdman had sort of completely shaped that uh, program. He had he brought them down from broken um, after the uh, 2011 World Cup, and he he sort of rebuilt them all. And I think that there was um, like almost like codependence or something. It kind of felt like the players felt like they couldn't do it without John. John was like the the man who figured everything out. And I think for Kenneth Heiner Muller to come in after that is a really different difficult thing to do. And I think that he easily could have just continued on what John Herdman was doing. He worked under John Herdman. He could have um, just been exactly like John Herdman. And I think he made enough changes uh, to that program and put enough of his mark on it internally that that's what she's reacting to. And that's what the players appreciated. Um, so I, I, I'm not surprised by that response from her. Um, I know she, she's praised him very highly in the past. And I think that he's uber competitive. And of course she is as well. And I think that that, um, it really plays into um, her her sort of wheelhouse in a lot of ways. I think he's a little bit more, more reserved. And in a lot of ways, I think they're actually fairly similar, which is, is kind of interesting. Um, so I think that um, 
yeah, I think I'm not super surprised by that because I just, I think that with those players, he did manage to make his mark um, just really supporting them, which I mean, is a good thing for the program. I think it's good for this program to know that they didn't necessarily need to be good. And I will say that like, overall, it's pretty disappointing. I mean, it's hard to say that when you look at something that says, you know, a 25 and 10 record, like it, it's still pretty good, but they didn't make that leap. But I don't necessarily know that the squad would have made that leap under John Herdman either. And I think it was good that at the very least they could sort of like hold the status quo under him um, and still be one of the best teams in the world. Because for a while, I think that the, the women's national team was so intrinsically linked with John Herdman that it almost felt like what was, it, what was going to happen when he was gone and the way he left, then it was just catastrophic. And like, it was wild. It's, that was wild. The whole thing is pretty wild, <laughs> frankly. Like when I look back on it, I'm like, I, I actually think that this period, as much as we might not remember it might. So let's look ahead then to what's next. So they have until August. That's when he is stepping down officially unless something changes. But that's what the press release stated, that August is the date that there will be a new coach name. So Ollie, I'll ask you this first. Who do you think the front runners are? I know it's still very early, but who jumps to mind as a potential candidate and why do you think that might be a good fit? Yeah, I, I don't know what you think, Laura, but to me, it seems very unlikely that we're going to see someone appointed who hasn't worked under or with John Herdman um, you know for some of the reasons you were just going over I think this is still in a lot of ways John Herdman's program and, and you look at the whole of Canada soccer and you know the Excel structure they put in place on the men's and the women's side it's, it's kind of Herdman's baby right mm -hmm. um, so for that reason I think they're going to want someone who is willing to work within that framework and, and kind of continue the work that's been done rather than mm -hmm. revolutionize anything mm -hmm. um, so for me, obviously, the one that stands out is Ryan Wilkinson, who's currently the, the head coach of the youth teams. That would be a gamble, I think. Um, you know, I think she's clearly a, a very sharp mind, clearly well respected by the players and, and has a lot of potential. But she is she is still a young coach. Um, she's had mixed results at the youth level. And, and so, you know, you don't want to promote someone like that too soon and, and set them up to fail. But I certainly think she'll be in the mix. And then the other one that, that came to mind for me was, was Bev Priestman, who was Herdman's assistant. Uh, when he was with the women's team is now was now Phil Neville's assistant with, with the England women's team and, and seems to be in the running for that. She is English, so I, I would imagine that's probably the, the job that she's got her eye on right now. But if, if that didn't work out, then I wonder if, if Canada might take a look at bringing her back into the picture. Laura, anything, yeah. Dan? Those would be the two standouts for me um, as well. I would like to see it be a woman. We've had a, ma a male coach for almost 10 years at the head of this program, and I think that it's time to go back to having a woman head coach. I think that Canada Soccer has spoken a lot um, in, about promoting women in the game and, and putting women in positions that are not just on the field, and I think that they should try and live up to that standard. I know that you want to get the best person for the job, but I think that there are a lot of phenomenal women's coaches out there. And I think that you could, you could find somebody. Uh, I agree with Oliver. I think that um, Rian would be a gamble in some senses. And I, you don't want to throw her out there too soon because she is really sort of being positioned as the future of this program. And she's not old. I mean, she's what, like maybe in her late thirties at this point. So there's still time for her. Um, you do run into a, a sort of an interesting um, position if the person that you hire stays around for a long time. Um, and I, Bev Priestman is also probably only slightly older than Rian Wilkinson, if, if at all. And I think right. that you, you're, you're getting a young coach and she could theoretically stay on. A lot of women's teams have their coaches for, for a very long time. So it'll be interesting to see sort of how they position Rian um, either as the head coach and, and really go for it and, and see um, what they're doing or around a new head coach. Like how is she, where, what, where, how does she fit into this plan? Because we know she's part of the plan. So is, is now the time for her? Um, she's never really sort of spoken about it. She's never really touched on whether or not she's interested in the head coaching role. So you're making assumptions that because she's like worked at all these other levels that you want to get to that top level. But eventually she's the kind of person that I think would draw job offers from club teams and from other nations um, if she's in an assistant role for too long. So it's going to be a sort of an interesting juggling act for Canada soccer. But I think you're right um, in the sense that it's going to be somebody who's already linked to the program. I'd be surprised if they brought 
brought in an outsider because they've had success there. So, so why not um, try and replicate it? Mm -hmm. Whoever they do pick, I don't think there's too many secrets that there are some issues. There are some things to iron out before Tokyo rolls around. And the, the timing makes it even more interesting because this is quite possibly the last major tournament we see of Christine Sinclair. Not that I've ever thought to bet against her because that we've always learned that to be an unwise bet. But if this is perhaps the last, at least Christine Sinclair at peak performance, Dana Matheson, Sophie Schmidt, you start to wonder how many more years they have left in them. That makes this transition difficult, but they need a coach that's going to get them to be able to score. And we that was always the question mark heading into the Olympic qualifying tournament. Group stage was great. And then Costa Rica rolled around the semifinal, one goal. Then they didn't score against the Americans. Then after that, the scoring seemed to disappear altogether once again. So scoring aside, what are some of the biggest issues to tackle for whoever they do name as the next head coach of this program, Laura? Um, I, I think that for me, it's not necessarily so much the scoring that's the, I mean, it's a lead up to the scoring, but I think that in the world cup, they were not creative whatsoever at front. I do think that we saw more of that in the CONCACAF tournament. That being said, the, the, uh, the quality of the competition was obviously like a step down from what you're seeing at the world cup. So that's part of the reason there was no, the, like the passing, it wasn't, as, it wasn't incisive at the world cup. Um, and I think that that's, that's a huge problem because there are players that can score, but you need to be dynamic. You need to be making those plays up front. You need to be getting more out of the likes of Janine Becky and Nichelle Prince and Adriana Leon. And you need, I think one big thing is you need a coach to come in and to find a way to make Jesse Fleming the center of that team. I think that's going to be huge transition for this uh, program because you are going to lose a Sophie Schmidt. You are going to lose a Desiree Scott in the next little while. And they need somebody who can be creating from that midfield spot. And that I think is Jesse Fleming. I think you see Jesse Fleming's brain work just a little bit faster than some of the other players on the team every once in a while. And I think that that's um, sort of problematic in the sense that it, it sometimes seems like they don't connect. It's like, she's a little right. bit too fast. So I think you need to find a way to make her a more central player. And I think that would lead to a lot um, more incisiveness or, I mean, alternatively, they have played around with Ashley, Mid Ashley Lawrence back in the midfield. Maybe you find a way to make that a partnership. I think that she is arguably the best player on the Canadian women's national team right now. Um, so you want to try and get more out of her, but I think that in general, they need to get more out of these players and they need somebody who can do that um, in the lead up to the attack, because you just, you know, you're, you're not, you're not even creating the chances. Like it's not a problem necessarily of scoring. It's like, you can't score if you don't create the chances and they were not creating the chances. Like it's kind of basic, you know, basic math, can't <laughs> score, you know? So we need a mathematician is what you're yeah. saying. Okay, exactly. perfect. Glad, glad we're on the same page. Yeah, yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. There's there's two big things for me. One one is the attacking, which Laura has just covered, so I won't go into that that too much. But I, I do think that Kenneth Heiner Muller did develop kind of the possession side of the game, the defensive organization. That, there were things like that that improved, I thought, over the past couple of years, and were actually pretty good at the World Cup. Um, but obviously, you know, it all fell down in, in their inability to create chances and score goals. And, and there's a lot of things to discuss there in terms of you know, how do you adapt Christine Sinclair's role as she gets older? As Laura said, where does Jesse Fleming play and how do you get the best out of her and so on? Um, but this, the second thing I think as well is, is that you need someone who kind of has the force of personality like John Herdman did to create a bit of excitement and capture the imagination a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think this is something we keep coming back to when we're talking about the national teams, the CPL, all throughout Canadian soccer. Is, is we're still trying to grow this game and, and you still have to persuade people, you know, why does your team matter? Um, why should people watch? Why should people be excited about this team? And John Herdman has, has been very good at that. And, yeah. you know, that has the effect of, A, getting more people to watch, which is obviously important. We need attention on the teams. But I think it also serves the purpose of, of focusing the players and, and giving them that reason why, you know, that motivation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our colleague Carmelina wrote a good piece, I think it was before the, the Nations League, um, talking about how the, the men's national team needed to, to find that. And she gave the example of, you know, the 2011 World Cup, they were tucked away, completely lonely, bored, felt detached from, from a nation, didn't have that kind of, you know, motivation of representing their country. And, and then comparing that to 2012, when, when John Herdman really ignited that, it was, it was a completely different team in the space of a year, right? So, so you need someone who has that kind of personality, um, you know, not just to 
be you know get the details right and be a good tactician and a good person which I think Kenneth Heinemola was all of those things but to actually really light a fire under the players and, and get people excited about this team again. Yeah, I think one thing too is that this team, in terms of getting people to watch this team, I think the country sort of had expectations of this Canadian team. I think that they think back to when a lot of the touchstone for a lot of people in this country is that 2012 London Olympics and that, uh, you know, they repeated in Rio. And the thing is that they need to get better, I think, at this point. They're kind of stuck in a hard place because the men's team is different. The men's team, a lot of people don't have expectations for the men's team. So when they do something good, it's like, well, they beat the, like, I mean, not to minimize beating the U.S. That was an incredible accomplishment, but um it's 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 huge whereas the women's team they're sort of they're they're working in increments at this point they need to get like sort of incrementally better to be one of the best teams in the world they're kind of like somewhere in the top 10 and they're they're good but they're not good enough and I think that you in some ways you have to it it all kind of links you have to be getting better to inspire people again because you you kind of think oh this team's good like we expect them to be good that's great, but it's like they need to be kind of great at this point to like re-inspire, which is a really hard uh, position for a coach to come in and say, hey, go out there and beat the U.S. Like, it's just not that easy. We've seen it. Which this and is not there yet. Well, and, and that's one of the good things about the Olympics is, is that, you know, it's pretty easy to get out of the group because the yeah. third place team, most of the third place teams qualify. And then you only need to win one game and you're playing for a medal, right? So, so that's a tournament that, you know, a bit more than the World Cup gives you that opportunity to be playing in big games and meaningful yeah. games um, mm-hmm. quite quickly. Yeah, it's a good start for sure. Yeah. We've addressed the past, a bit of the future. I want to talk about where this team is right now. We've seen, we've discussed some of that evolution, some of the growth or perhaps lack thereof in certain areas of their, their, the program itself, but where are they right now? Did the loss to the U.S. and then a, a very weird turnaround of France with the pandemic just coming in and then Diana Matheson showing up and being a hero in the last game, where do we read them as right now? One year out from an Olympic game, should be at the Olympics right now, but one year out, where do we see this team right now? Perhaps some areas that still need to be addressed and some strengths that might be overlooked a little bit, Laura. Diana Matheson showing up and being a hero is just like a theme for this team. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Pretty much what she, she basically should wear a cape whenever she yeah, goes on the Yeah, exactly. Field. Yeah, it would, it would really fly. Um, <laughs> I think that this team has the sort of components to be the best. I mean, we've heard this time and time again. They've said it time and time again. This is the best squad they've ever had. I think that they have the components for that. I think that they have the veteran sort of leadership. They have a really solid group of their best players who I think are sort of on the young side still. You think that like you forget that like Ashley Lawrence just turned 24. feels like she's been around forever. Um, But I think that I I don't think that they're, they're, they're showing that really. And I don't think that they've showed that, I don't know, since Rio really when they I mean Rio was huge when they had that win over Germany there were some big um big games for them there um and I think that uh they really haven't shown what they can do at all consistently they've had marks of sparks of it but you look at that U.S. game and I went into it thinking there's no way that they're going to win this game like they just don't have the quality the U.S. and they don't have the depth either which I think is a conversation to be had and I don't it's very hard to create depth when you're doing a national team program in some ways because like they got to be Canadian like how many good Canadians do we have it's not like you can just like go sign somebody from elsewhere but they don't have those like necessarily options off the bench so I think that's a big thing um and and you hope that like a Jordan Heidema is going to be the kind of player um, that steps into that role and can maybe be a starter and then you put somebody else on the bench or, or whatever the case may be. But I think that they definitely need to work on their depth. Of course, they have to work on their scoring. I think the back line's pretty solid. And as Ollie said, I think the organization is good, which is great. Um, I think the partnership between Kadisha and uh, Shalina is very solid, which is which is good to see. I think they complement each other very nicely. And I think Kadisha is really growing into herself, which I think is going to be huge for this team. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how they transition their goalkeepers. I don't know, like that Steph LeBay is going to play much longer than through the end of next year. So how do you get, uh, Kaylin Sheridan and Sabrina D'Angelo in the mix? 
Um, I think that this team has a lot of room to grow and I think that they have the potential to do that, but I just don't, don't see them sort of becoming that next level. And I think you look at a team like England and I think England has found a way to sort of take some pretty big strides in the last few years. And the competition is only getting more difficult for the women's national team to be one of the best teams in the world. And I'm, I'm concerned that they're not necessarily keeping up with the pack. Ollie, I know you can argue just about anything. You're very good at this on this show. We give you a topic and say, hey, can you debate this? And you say, yeah, sure, no problem. But is this an easier one that I'm about to give you that perhaps a coaching change ahead of Tokyo isn't actually a bad thing for this team? Uh, no, it might not be. And like the really optimistic take on this team is that they're a hell of a lot better with the ball and in possession than they were when, obviously, when John Herdman took over, it's night and day. Um defensively as we've said I, I think they did a, to improve a lot over the past couple of years and then that side of it has, has come along and so if you can find a coach who as I say can maybe light a bit of a fire under the team and also maybe just take the shackles off the team a little bit going forwards you know if you can marry those two things together then you might have something um on the other hand as Laura said you know that everyone else is getting better as well um, and you have an Olympic field already with, with a couple of teams still left to qualify there where there's, you know, seven or eight good teams in there. Um, and, and, and so get, just getting into the knockout stage, although you only have to finish top three usually, um, is not completely straightforward. So um, I, I do think a coaching change is a good thing to answer your question, because I, I, as I say, I just think they need a bit of rejuvenation here. Um, and I, I do think they need someone who's maybe going to take a few more risks and, and, and take the seatbelt off a little bit. We've already mentioned Carmelita on this show, so we're going to get a double dose of Moscato on the hangout today. <laughs> Question or the quote that she had in the KNPL, or just a couple, I think it was the day after, a couple days after the departure was announced, Carm was quoted as saying that the new coach needs to get the, this last generation of veterans optimized. Um, is that the right approach? Not to take away anything from what Carm said, but is that necessarily the best strategy? Should we still be focusing on milking whatever last bits of energy we can out of these veterans or big picture? Do we need to start looking towards filling that gap between the youth of the Ashley Lawrence's and the Jordan Heidemas, and then the, the old guard with Matheson, Schmidt, Scott, Sinclair, Laura. Um, with all due respect to Carm, I disagree. maximizing the veterans. I think that this team has been too centered for a long time on Christine Sinclair. Um, and I think that Christine Sinclair is still the, the most talented player uh, on the field, but I don't necessarily know that she's always the best player. And I also think that you have to, have to start picturing a future without these players. And because it's gonna come and, and, and we could see a lot of them leaving after the world, uh, after the, um, the Olympics, I mean, sure, you, you want to maximize them in the next year because you know that you're going to have them. But I also think that um, for a long-term, short-term, long-term plan, you need to start giving more responsibility to the younger players. I think that they need to be more involved. And I mean, they're the players who are going to be on the field because they're the best players on the team. So I think that those are the players you want to grow. It's always this kind of conversation about what is more important to you, the World Cup or the Olympics? And for me, I personally think the World Cup is a more important tournament. I think that that's where you really see how your organization, your, your nation stacks up against the best in the world because of the sort of um, uniqueness of the, the Rio or the Olympic tournament. I, ju I just don't know if it, it's that good of a judge. So I, I personally think that stacking up for the world cup is, is a better sort of um, gives you a better understanding of where you're at. And I just think that that um, means paying attention to your young players more um, and maybe getting the best out of your veterans in different ways. I think that's important. I think that they're very important voices in the team. I don't necessarily know that they all need to be starting and that they all need to be playing 90 minutes. So maybe you find a way to maximize them. I mean, you're talking about fire, and I agree that, that that's necessary. Think back to Abby Wambach at the 2015 World Cup here in Canada. She was a bench player who came on with 30 minutes left to play. And she sat on the bench and she, she screamed at them for like 60 minutes until she got on the field and screamed at them for another 30 minutes. Like maybe you don't necessarily, maybe all of this igniting fire doesn't necessarily have to be done by the coach. Maybe it will also be done by these veteran players sort of taking on that sort of role and, and understanding um, 
they might not always be the center of the team like they were before, but what they have and their experience is huge. And here's how you can help like sort of ignite um, that for the players who can actually maybe get it done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if you read my mind there, Laura, because we have one final topic that we want to get to before we say goodbye. And you mentioned the, the debate Olympics versus World Cup, which is more prestigious, which means more. But there's sort of this unspoken but understood notion that so much funding for these teams comes from Olympic participation mm -hmm. with the way the, the Canadian government, the Olympic um, on the podiums, programs like that work, that they inject such revenue into these programs. So Ollie, without having seen the spreadsheets and knowing all the numbers off by heart, big picture, is that a problem where if and assuming that the Olympics are providing such a catalyst for the funding for these programs? Well, yeah, in a way it is, because I agree with Laura. I think that the World Cup is a far better yardstick of, of where you really rank among, you know, the world's best teams, right? Um, so, so, yeah, it's a bit of an issue there. And, and I, I agree with Laura again that I would like to see the young players given more responsibility next summer now in, in, in Tokyo. And I would like to see the Olympics used potentially in stone to the World Cup. Um, I think the reality is right now, is, is it's probably more the other way around and, and they do see the Olympics as kind of the end of the cycle and and where they, they try to peak so that, that's kind of the way it is right right now um, but yeah I, I would like to see them put more emphasis on the World Cup. Mm -hmm. Yeah it's interesting all that you mentioned the way that they structure their cycles because I think that you're right it, sh it should almost be the, the other way around you yeah. can still get that Olympic funding this team should still be able to get that Olympic funding without peaking at the Olympics. They are a good enough team to be able to do that. Um, so I think for me, I would, I would prefer to, to use the Olympics, as you said, a stepping stone to the world cup. Here's our like check-in before we go and play the best competition in the world, because you just, you don't want to see a repeat of 2019. 2019 was not great um, by, by anybody's measure. And I think that uh, that is where that is where you you compete and where you have the most. Um, I don't know, guys. I don't know. Like I, <laughs> no, I just lost it there. I, I think That's as well as stuff. Yeah, <laughs> save me. I, I think as well. It's it's only going in in one direction, right? Like the the more the women's game grows and the more FIFA actually starts paying attention to it, the bigger the World Cup is going to become, and yeah. it will take on a landscape more like the men's game, where the World Cup is clearly a lot bigger uh, than the Olympics. So in terms of you know the the commercial appeal of the team, the popularity of the team, all of the things that you can sell around the team and make money from, mm -hmm. um, I think they're going to be a lot more oriented around the World Cup going forwards than they are the Olympics. So maybe in the longer term, you know, kind of flipping that viewpoint would would be more. Again, I don't I don't know the numbers, but more financially mm -hmm. beneficial. I mean, the way they do it on the men's side, you remember, is that it's a U23 team, right? So yeah. the, like, that's yeah. really a, sort of a developmental tournament, and that's how a lot of countries see it. And I think that the women's national team would do well to sort of see it as a de de developmental tournament on the way to proving that you're one of the world's best at the World Cup. Mm -hmm. Been a very healthy conversation, half an hour long, and, and for an announcement that took a lot of people off guard and caught a few people by surprise on Wednesday. We appreciate you guys, your insight, helping us navigate through this as we transition away from the Kenneth Heiner Muller era, which is yet to have a name for the chapter, but it will one day and a good look towards the future. So Laura, thank you very much for joining us. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me, you guys. It's a blast. For Ollie and the guys behind the scenes, producer Kyle and technical director Armin, thanks for joining us. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Like this video if you liked it and share it with a friend. Spread the love, be kind to each other, be positive, and we'll talk to you real soon on the One Soccer Hangout.